have your Bibles and can follow along, we're reading from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32. I'll be reading from the New International Version, and it states it this way. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that your love is so great and so powerful. And even though it seems small when it first begins in our lives, when you first touch us with your love, it grows beyond what we can imagine or comprehend. And Father, we thank you for this great love that you have given us and your word that you have given us to understand more about who you are and more about your love. Father, we thank you for this passage because we sometimes feel small and very insignificant. And yet, if your power, if your life is in our lives, if we have given our hearts to you, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Father, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to comprehend. But as small as we are, with your power and in you, in Christ, we can do great things. So, Father, work through us. Show your power in us. Teach us your ways. And we ask it in Christ. Amen. In 1952, Paul Barron, an engineer for the RAND Corporation, found a way to move messages through a network of Defense Department computers. In 1968, the Department of Defense founded the Advanced Research Projects Agency to continue Mr. Barron's work. By 1971, 23 computers were linked together through this project. In 1981, the IBM Corporation brought the computer into the home to the personal computer, or the PC. In 1986, the Advanced Research Projects Agency joined forces with the National Science Foundation and to form the backbone of what we now know as the Internet. By 1992, more than one million computers were linked together through the Internet. By 1995, more than 30 million computers were linked together through the Internet. As of 2011, more than 2.1 billion computers were linked together 
through the internet. See, the internet is like the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven began small with a few disciples following the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's grown over 2,000 years. Person to person, culture to culture, with more and more people getting online with God every day, even every hour. Last week, we looked at the parable of the wheat and the tares. This morning, we're going to look at the parable of the mustard seed. The mustard seed, the parable of the mustard seed, illustrates the amazing growth of the kingdom of heaven. So how can something so tiny become so powerful and so important? We're going to look at two ways this morning that this truth can impact our lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. First of all, let's look at seeing can be deceiving. Seeing can be deceiving. Look at verse 31. The Bible says another parable. He put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. In Matthew 13, Jesus taught using parables. A parable is a part of speech that uses something familiar to teach something that is unfamiliar. And Jesus used parables to teach about the kingdom of heaven. And so far we've seen the parable of the four soils and the parable of the wheat and tares. And now we're going to look at the parable of the mustard seed. This parable shows us what happens when human responsibility meets the sovereignty of God. And the result is incredible growth. Jesus taught how the kingdom of heaven grew from a very small beginning to something truly unimaginable in size. And again, he used an agricultural analogy to make his point. He used the mustard shrub. The mustard shrub was a plant that was typically in every garden in the ancient Middle East. They're annuals, like tomatoes and corn. And they typically grow to become the largest of all the plants in the garden. They grow to 10 to maybe 15 feet in height. And Jesus chose the mustard shrub because it begins as the smallest seed, yet grows to the largest plant. Someone right now is thinking, hold the phone. Wait a minute. Verse, 30, verse 32 says that Jesus said, the mustard seed is the least of all seeds. Yet I've been watching television. And I learned on the learning channel, that's not true. I learned on the discovery channel that the black orchid seed is the smallest seed in the world. Well, guess what? That's right. The black orchid seed is smaller than the mustard seed. Whoa, do we need to stop? Have we just found an error in the Bible? Did Jesus say the mustard seed is the least of all seeds? In verse 32, he said that. And we know science has revealed to us that the black orchid seed is actually smaller than the mustard seed, what's going on? We're going to learn something this morning about hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the art and the science 
of biblical interpretation. You see, we have to remember Jesus was in Israel in the first century speaking to people who were born and raised in that part of the world. That's all they knew. Black orchids grow in tropical environments, not in arid ones like the Middle East. Let's face it. Jesus could have talked about the DNA of the mustard seed. He could have talked in terms of knowledge of things that we have no idea. We have not learned. That knowledge has not been presented to us. But he didn't. He spoke in language that they could understand. The Bible uses language that its original audience could understand. The Bible uses language that we can understand. We do the same thing. Let me give you a test. Does the sun rise in the east or does it, or does it rise in the west? East, duh. No, it doesn't. The sun doesn't rise in the east. I'm surprised at you and me. The sun doesn't rise in the east. It just looks that way. It just appears to us to be that way. The truth is, and this is basic science, the sun stands still. And the earth rotates around the sun. And as it rotates around the sun, the earth revolves. And as the earth turns, it looks like the sun is rising. The sun doesn't rise. The earth turns. So the sun doesn't rise in the east. It just looks like it does to us. So we do the same thing. The black orchid seed is actually smaller than the mustard seed, but to someone living in the first century in Israel, the mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds. And you know what? It is. In fact, it's itty bitty bitty bitty. They're real little. They're tiny. It takes 20,000 mustard seeds to make an ounce. They're tiny seeds. But Jesus wasn't giving us a lesson on botany. <laughs> he was teaching about the kingdom of heaven. And his point was the mustard shrubs begin very small and grows to be very large. And that's what the kingdom of heaven does began as something very small and grows to be something very large. It began as a seemingly insignificant movement in a very obscure part of the Roman Empire in the Middle East about 2,000 years ago. Today, it's incalculable in size. It is encompassed by every person that has ever lived and ever placed their faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it continues to grow at an amazing, amazing rate. So let's look secondly at the growth of the kingdom. Verse 32, Jesus said, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. It's amazing to think something as tiny as a mustard seed, 20,000 in one ounce, that's tiny, it's amazing to think about something as tiny as the mustard seed to grow in such a... ...large plant, the largest of all the plants in the garden. And it's just as amazing to think that the kingdom of heaven could begin as small as one man and grow into what it is today. But that's what's happened. The kingdom of heaven is more vast than any of our minds and all of our minds put together can ever begin to comprehend. Yet some people, listen, some people deny its existence. Many, many, many more people simply live like they deny it. Many people, whether we would admit it or not, live as though Jesus Christ has no bearing whatsoever on our lives. If you were to see us on a Tuesday, we wouldn't behave the same way that we do on Sunday morning. 
Sometimes we, we live as though Jesus Christ has no bearing whatsoever on our lives. And many people think that if they are not interested in God or the things of God, then they can opt out of their responsibility or accountability to God. And I guess I've met all of those people or heard all those arguments. I've heard many, many people say in witnessing conversations at the very beginning to cut me off, I'm not a religious person. I've heard that many times. Let me interpret that for you. This is what that means. When someone says, I'm not religious, or I'm not a religious person, what that means is I have made the choice to ignore God in my life. That's what it means. I've made the choice to ignore God in my life. God may be for other people, and that's fine, but he's not for me. I'm not a church-going person. I'm not a religious person. And some people think that they can ignore God and really and truly get away with it. Some people think they can blaspheme God and get away with it. There was a so-called comedian several years ago, many years ago, who made his living by making fun of Jesus Christ. His was a part of a comedy genre called shock comedy because he made fun of the things that we hold to be sacred. And he became very successful and very famous and very wealthy. I heard a sound bite from one of his performances one day on a Christian radio station exposing him in, in this this shock comedy genre that I'd never heard of until that point as I was driving down the road. And on that particular day, in that particular soundbite, he was making fun of the second coming of Christ. He was making fun of all of us who believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. A few weeks later, after I heard that soundbite, that same comedian made the news again. He had died in an automobile accident. In fact, witnesses stated that they saw him burn to death. Horrible. Just horrible. Tragic. And I'm sorry that happened, and I'm so sorry that happened, because he isn't laughing anymore. It's not funny anymore. People who live life indifferent and unconcerned about Jesus Christ will one day change their mind because there's coming a day when every person will be concerned. There's coming a day when every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. There's coming a day when every person will realize that all of life comes down to Jesus Christ and how we relate to Him. Everyone that has ever lived will one day appreciate the words of John chapter 3 and verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The kingdom of heaven began as something so seemingly insignificant. Jesus Christ and his handful of followers against the power of the mighty Roman Empire. It appeared to those who would deny the empty tomb that 
that Jesus simply lived his life and was crushed under the authority of the Romans. But that small beginning was in fact undefeatable. The kingdom of heaven is more awesome, more powerful than anything, anytime, anywhere. And if you ever doubt that, just check the calendar. Because I've got news. Jesus Christ split time. Every time we look at the calendar, we're reminded of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the calendar is. It's a testimony to the power and the influence of Jesus Christ. It's been roughly 2,012 years since Jesus Christ came to the world in the flesh. And the only way the kingdom of heaven grows is when a sinner gets saved. And that happens every day. No. Glory to God, that happens every moment. That happens every hour. Tens of thousands of souls are coming into the kingdom of heaven even as we speak this morning. Listen, every hour, 667 Muslims come to faith in Jesus Christ in Africa alone. That's six million a year. According to Muslims, not according to secular press or according to church press, according to Muslims, there were about one million Christians in Africa in 1900. In 2000, there were 330 million Christians in Africa. According to the website persecution.org, more Muslims have come to Jesus Christ in Iran in the past 30 years than in the previous 1,300 years. And right now, tens of thousands of Muslims in Iran are coming to Jesus Christ. And one Christian in Iran, you say, it's making the news. Because someone has a gun to his head and threatening to send him to glory if he doesn't repent of his faith in Jesus. All the while, tens of thousands of Iranians are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. CNN and Fox News isn't, isn't telling us that part of the story. For years, the world has been telling us that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. That's not true. Christianity, if you want to call it a religion, Christianity is not only the largest religion in the world, it's the fastest growing in the world. People are coming to Jesus Christ like never before in the history of the world. The kingdom of heaven is growing at an exponential rate. Jesus said in Matthew 28 and 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for nations is ethnos in that verse. We get our word ethnic from that word. It literally means people groups. Now listen. Listen, this is important. Listen. According to the website, Global Status of Evangelical Christianity, which is an international mission board website. According to the website, Global Status of Evangelical Christianity, as of February 1st, 2012, 94.1% of all people groups in the world have at least some witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Did you hear that? You can check it out yourself. You can look it up yourself. Global status of evangelical Christianity. It's an international mission board website. As of February 1st, 2012, 94.1% of all people groups in the world have at least some witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 14. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The word for nations in Matthew 24, 14 is the exact same word for nation in Matthew 28, 19. Ethnos. People group. And as of six weeks ago, we were 94.1% there. With the technology of our day, in two weeks we could be 100%. Never before, never, ever before in the history of the world have we been this close to reaching all of the people groups and all of the world as we are today? I'm telling you, we're living in exciting, exciting and important times. It's incredible to know that God gives us a role in growing the kingdom of heaven. Because people come to Jesus Christ because people tell people about the life-changing gospel of Christ. And we have an incredible opportunity to grow the kingdom of heaven through God's church at Northgate in the next four weeks especially as we seek to minister to people in our community through Friend Day. Invite a friend to church next Sunday morning. Through the Don Piper event, we've already given away about 600 tickets for that event. Then we have the Easter egg hunt on March 31st, which always draws from our community. And then, of course, on April the 8th, a month from today is Easter Sunday. So let me, listen, friends, let me encourage you to pray and to give and to serve and to go as we seek to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to our generation while there's time. The Bible doesn't say that every person will have to hear the gospel. All the nations. Ethnos. People group. And then the end will come. And we're close. That's exciting, but it's scary because I've got friends that aren't saved. And one fact remains either we are going to meet Jesus or He is coming to judge us. One of the two. We're going to have a meeting with Christ. He'll either be our Savior or He'll be our judge. And we have the opportunity, incredible opportunity, to join forces with the power of the Holy Spirit and present the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that is indifferent, thinking they can opt out of God, we can tell them. We have four incredible opportunities coming up in the next four weeks to do just that. The Don Piper event is just as simple as asking someone, providing a ticket. 
That's like a seed that was sown. And those, some of those seeds will fall on the wayside. Some on stony ground, some on thorny soil, some on good soil. Pray about sowing some seed this week. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this parable. It teaches an awesome truth. God, we thank you for your mercy. Allowing us to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to have an opportunity to come into the kingdom of heaven. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who convicts us of our sin and our need for Jesus Christ. And we pray, God, that you would move upon us even now in such a mighty, powerful way that would overwhelm us and reveal your unstoppable power. Lord, change us. Overcome our pride. Sweep over us like a tsunami. Overpower our pride, our selfishness, that we might surrender wholly to Jesus Christ, that he might in turn receive honor, glory, and worship from his church. Revive us, Lord. Move upon our hearts. Open our eyes to the urgency of the moment. What you're doing in our lives, in our community, and in this world. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you're not sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. you got to know that. That's the, simply the most important decision anyone will ever make. If you were to die today, you know for sure you'd go to heaven. If you're not sure, be sure today. There's no security outside of a personal relationship with Christ. And I want you to have that security. The Lord wants you to have that security for your time. Or maybe you are a Christian. But sometimes the world creeps in and we follow the wrong voice. And it's time to come home and rededicate your life to the Lord. You come. Maybe God is calling you to join this church. I don't know how he's speaking, but I know he's speaking. So let's simply obey. And you come as the Lord calls. Ricky, would you come and lead us, please?